Once upon a time there was I reached where's and I reached lost For ages of Irish blood They were waking to the morning Waking to the morning Again, the process that I the Belfast I still days went through a pretty long soul searching process. And what we tried to do was we tried to get plays that were the, and we tried to get the flavors of the lectures that were almost the choice of heroes. So Mellows was Bobby Sands' hero, so Mellows became a woman. Countess Markovich obviously it's International Women's Week, and um, what better person could you have for that? And Markovich was tonight's choice. The first one we began with was the James Connolly play, which uh, was delivered in Culterland by Fergus O'Hare. The reason he picked Connolly was fairly simple. Everybody knows about 1916, people know about the execution. What we tried to get was a flavour of the man, how Connolly ended up in the GPO, and why he was there, what his life was about. And that was the theme, the person rather than the event. And tonight's play is no exception. That many of us will, either as children or as adults or in jail or in reading or whatever, will know Markovich. We know about her. We know some of her traits. We know very little about the bad things, the bad temper that apparently she had. The, the, the author who, who wrote the play tells the play through the eyes of Yeats, who was a class contemporary of Markovich, although in terms of his Republican credentials, you could argue they were quite different. But he tells a story of how he seen Markovich and what Markovich was doing through his eyes, he then relays to us. So that, that's the theme of the play tonight. I want to tell you just a wee bit about the National Graves who are the people who put the play on. For many of us, the National Graves are a crowd of older men and women, and in my case, not so old, who you see every year walking up these to commemoration. There is a, a wealth of work that goes on behind all of that. For instance, from last Easter until Easter coming, we will have produced a book, we will have produced four plays, we will have commissioned five sets of posters, we will have done, I think, three presentations, we will have done a presentation in Stormy, we will have met countless delegations. We will have put on a week-long exhibition, in fact, in this room, where hundreds of people would have went. We have a website that Sean Osborne would look after that updates uh, things about the graveyard and, and things that we're trying to do, we're trying to plan. We do tours in the graveyard. We look after the theme main Republican plots as well as 37 other plots of the National Graves, Belfast National Graves have taken responsibility for. There are hundreds of things that we want to do. There are dozens of things that we need to do. Our problem is there are very few of us. So if you watch these and you attend these for commemoration, and maybe you have some time on your hand, maybe you have some ideas, we would appreciate your help and we would certainly appreciate, appreciate your ideas. Many, many things we need to do. In the middle of that whole array of work that I've just outlined, the plots, as you probably know, have been attacked on two occasions this year. They've been attacked with paint and with hammers. There is no compensation that's readily available for, to replace the plots. Nevertheless, they're replaced as quickly as we can and the damage is done is repaired as quickly as we can repair it. So all of that is the work of the graves. As I say, we're always looking for new members. If people are free, if they have time, um, come and talk to us. Let us know what you can do. We'll tell you what we do, and you, we can kind of match what you want to do and what we need you to do, and try and fit them together. So, you're more than welcome. The final thing that I would say to you about all of these is that educate that you may be free. And this is about what we are and where we come from to understand where we are today. Last week in Dublin, the first Sinn Féin woman was elected to the Dáil from Countess Markovich. This week is the anniversary of the murder on the, on the, the rocks in Gibraltar where Maria Farrell died. This is International Women's Week. So all of this has, has a meaning in some shape or form. So hopefully when you leave here, and let's stop the kind of knowledge 
or not stop your, your interest in Markovich, it'll begin a whole new chapter. So that's all I've got to say, just to remind you, if you would please turn your lights out, <laughs> please turn your phones off. And this is the best part for me. Paul, can we have the lights? <laughs> little patience knew from childhood on had now so much. A grey gull lost its fear, flew down to her cell and there I lit, and there endured her fingers touch and from her fingers at its bit. Did she in touching that lone wing recall the years before her mind became a bitter and abstract thing? or thought some popular enmity. Blind and leader of the blind, drinking the foul ditch where they lie. When long ago I saw her ride under Van Bulben to the meet, the beauty of her countryside with all youth's lonely wildness stirred, she seemed to have grown clean and sweet like any rock-bred sea-born bird. Seaborne or balanced in the air, when first it sprang out of the nest upon some lofty rock to stare upon the cloudy canopy, while under its storm beaten breast cried out the hollows of the sea. There were seven signatories to the proclamation of Pothok Naher. But in my opinion, one name that should have been there, not as an afterthought or a token female, but signed in her own right as a significant leader along with the others, Countess Markovitz. I always thought it would end badly for her, but then it didn't really end badly for her at all. But what I will say is, too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. And that's how I often thought about calm. What is it now? I'm supposed to be in solitary confinement. Can I not be left alone with my thoughts? If you don't bring me news of my comrades, then go. You have nothing I need. You should be ashamed to call yourself an Irish woman, doing the dirty work of your English masters. Don't you understand? You mean nothing to them. You're just a tool they use to keep your own people in your class down. Oh, Miss Heidi, Heidi. Miss High and Mighty. Did you sleep well last night on your straw palias? <laughs> Miss your diamond feather, did you? Uh, did you dream of all the destruction ye and your likes caused? There's people out here with nowhere to sleep tonight because of ye! Oh, really? You think the poor and the starving and the homeless? They've always been here. I didn't make these most misfortunes happen. You can thank your British masters for that. Maybe. If we all unite, we can rid Ireland of everything that is British and bring back all that is Ireland, starting with her people. For Jesus, ye believe all that fucking crap! Ye fucking feminist whore! What about the widows and the orphans who depend on their war pension from Britain? Will ye be compensating demons? Hungry 
mouths make hungry minds. They listened to Redmond and sent their men to fight for what? For a broken promise. Better than dying for nothing. Ooh, uh, Mrs. <coughs> Pierce, now, <laughs> will she be getting a pension from your lot? What was that? Can't you guess? Or are you that fucking stupid? All changed. Changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she wrote to Harriers? All changed. Everything changed. A terrible beauty is born. Con and Eva lived life lavishly. Wealth flowed through Lissadell like the blue blood of royalty. There was no end to it. They were fortunate in that they were brought up to be kind. They empathized with the sickly and the poor. They always had a cause. Even more so than Con in the beginning, but then Con, darling Con, ran miles ahead with her generosity. And not just of wealth. There was something more. I have to talk of her spirit. She gave all and never counted the cost. One time I approached her in the soup kitchen. She ran for the strikers and their families during the Dublin lockout. She chased me, ordered me out. I said I was only joking. But she shooed me away, accusing me of being a damned nuisance. Sometimes darling Con could be so verbally forceful. You need more than that. Oh, your kindness. Thank you. I think only will keep us alive. You've more than the Brady's to feed. I'm not a greedy man. The family. All eight of them. How are they doing? Still at school? Ah, they're too sick. Too sickly to go da daily. They manage a day or two of the week at the house. But the youngest, she's really ill. We just can't get her to eat. The other families. They stay well away from our room in case they catch something. There's 79 of us in there, and only one closet. And nobody cleans up after they go. You're still in Church Street. Ah, well, we are for the moment. But if the child, if she gets any worse, we'll be on the street. Nobody wants to live under the same roof. A leaking roof at that, as a sick child. If not, then even the pawn. We can't afford to redeem the blankets we pawned two weeks since. I'll send, send some bedding round after we finish here for the night. And some medicine. And first aid. Thank you. And I'll send a doctor to look after the wee one. Oh, thank you, kindness. I'll bring this hot soup and the good news round the lamp. James! Tell Nora I'll need to speak to her later. I'll see her at Martha Kelly's along with Madeline. And Ireland's glory The heart, the shamrock Cream, white and gold